care of too often. The bottom line of what we do is we provide access to our collections and we preserve our collections. Now, I'm not going to go into the weeds of preservation and access. If you want to know more about that, you can ask us questions or you can come up. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about TIFF files, about WAV files, about MP3, uh, service copies, and all that stuff. We're, we'll, Jennifer, we'll all be happy to talk about that. And, uh, and Jesse Walter Fuchs. So we're going back to the very earliest recording technology. The very first ethnographic field recording was made in 1890 by Jesse Walter Fuchs. And this format right here, which is the next cylinder. So this is what I think it's complicated. Document the sounds of different cultures and historic events was this invention of the Edison cylinder recording machine in 1877. And we have over 10,000 of these cylinders. It's called the Federal Cylinder Project. They were made for different agencies like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Smithsonian, but all these cylinders came together at the Library of Congress at, as the Federal Cylinder Collection, and we cataloged them all. Um, let me play you one of these so you can hear the first ethnographic field recording ever made anywhere in the world. This is... Uh, the snake dance song, it's the Passamaquoddy snake dance song, and you're hearing the sound of Noel Josephs in Calais, Maine in March 1890. ethnographic field recording and if you can imagine what a miracle that was at the time that it happened. Um, here we have the founder of our archive. A lot of people think that our archive was founded by Alan Lomax. Actually not. It was founded by this, this man called Robert W. Gordon who had a passion for folk song and he declared that he was going to collect personally every American folk song in America. That was pretty ambitious. Uh, he didn't do it, but he made a good, darn good start. Um, he was recording on wax cylinder years before he got the post of the first head of the Archive of American Folk Song in 1928. And what he brought us was his personal collection of cylinders, much like the whole Library of Congress where Steve and I work. This is my colleague, Dr. Stephen Winnick whom you remember from having written for Dirty Linen for how many years? More than 20 years. More than 20 years. He was columnist and feature writer for Dirty Linen. Um, where was I? I wander. I digress. Uh, much like our Library of Congress collections were built on the personal collection of Thomas Jefferson, his personal library, our archive was built on the personal collection of Robert W. Gordon. and. Um, yeah, like he'd been collecting for six years before he even came on board, and um, he was kind of based in Darien, Georgia, and he was always short of money. And so we can kind of tell where he was by how far he could drive to collect on the half a tank of gas that the gas station would give him on credit, because he never had any money. Um, let's hear... One of the cylinders that he collected, kind of one of our greatest hits in the world. Uh, see if you can identify He's singing Come By Here in a Gullah accent. Do you notice that it's so much more syncopated than what white people ended up singing in the campfires <laughs> left out the syncopation, which is the cool part of it. So maybe by listening to archival field recordings, we can get back to the cooler version of Kumbaya. If that song stays in my head all day, I will not forgive you. Uh, there are worse mind worms and earworms to have, but I'll gladly accept the blame. Instantaneous discs 
which Chuck talked about here briefly, came on the scene in the early 1930s. A uh, big leap forward from cylinders in sound quality. Um, most of our classic recordings, which I refer to as the golden age of disc recording, uh, most of the stuff people want to hear from our archive are from this era of instantaneous disc recording. Um, anybody remember that album series? They, they looked very generic. They looked like kind of Soviet cigarette cartons with the red and gray covers. A uh, series of LPs that went into a lot of public libraries. Uh, that was our, our series that we started releasing in the 1940s. And a lot of people like Odetta, and back then and up to now, Don Flemons heard their first field recordings on our historic LP series, which started out life as 78s in an album, which is where we got that word album. It was kind of an accordion folder with lots of little 78s in it. Um, this is Charles Todd, not known as well as, as well as the name Alan Lomax, but a really important collector in our archive. And he's recording Mrs. Myra Pipkin on a Presto disc recorder in California. And like I say, most of our classic recordings were made on these instantaneous disc recorders on a, on a Presto disc cutter. Um, do you want to hear Mrs. Myra Pipkin? Let's hear who was the next, well, after his father. He was the assistant in charge. Uh, he got that job in 37, yeah. left yeah. in 42. And in between, he did a lot of really classic instantaneous disc recordings, like this first ever session that he recorded with Muddy Waters. Now these these instantaneous disc recordings were an improvement over over uh, wax cylinders in many ways. The um, the sound quality was better. You got a wider frequency range, but they had their problems too. And one of the problems is that the soft acetate coating over the stiffer aluminum base of these discs would sometimes um, wear with each repeated playing. So if a folklorist collected an instantaneous disc recording and then took that out on the lecture circuit to play it, to, to illustrate what he or she had collected, that disc would suffer degra degradation with every single playing. And the other problem with them is that over time they emit palmitic acid or stearic acid, which has to be cleaned off the discs. And we have people to do that for us. Um, I really, here's the thing, at the Library of Congress we have top of top flight professionals to clean off our stearic and palmitic acid off of our records and make uh, state of the art digital transfers. I don't want to do a show and tell of all our fantastic technology and leave you sitting there saying, but what about us? What do we do? So I'll skip quickly over that and just say, we do clean these up. We're doing it for you with your tax dollars so that you can come and hear these recordings or, or do it online in the privacy of your own home. 
Um, and that's a good use of tax money. Uh, glass-based disc, gosh, they broke. That was the big problem with glass-based disc. And it's, it's an archivist nightmare because you had these glass-based, we give everything a number, an AFS number, stood for Archive of Folk Song. Um, our AFS numbers, when they came to the glass-based discs, and all those, uh, many of those glass discs broke, suddenly you had to break in the series of numbering, which Chuck can appreciate, and every Ed and Melissa and everybody here, uh, we had to then rescue as many as we can and give them different numbers. So uh, there are certain people who've worked in our archives so long that they've memorized which glass-based disc numbers are out of sequence, and that's the kind of nerds that we are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's move on to the next one. We have, uh, we have all kinds of formats, antique formats, in addition to cylinders and instantaneous discs, and one of them were uh, this wire recording technology, which Don Yoder was a folk, is a folklorist who collected a lot of Pennsylvania German material in Pennsylvania on wire recordings. And um, they just looked like reels of, of soldering wire or something. Really, they did, and that was a recording format. And they get tangled, they have to be transferred, they get bent, they break. Um, so we also have the technology to end the playback. Here's the thing. We have like a museum of obsolete playback technology. We can play back these wire recordings on, uh, on the players. Uh, so we digitize them as well. And you <coughs> haven't lived until you've heard she, she'll be coming around the mountain in Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, mm -hmm. with punctuated by oh yeah that's fantastic <laughs> that's my favorite wire recording <laughs> so um, after discs um, the next big format starting in the late 1940s was with magnetic tape um, today when you come into the folk life reading room at the Library of Congress you still might be served an open reel tape, and I will thread it up for you because I don't know whether you do or don't know how to thread up these machines. Yeah. And I've turned, I've gone, turned my back, and I look around, and there's a pile of tape <laughs> on the floor, growing taller and taller. So I've decided I'm just going to thread up the machine for everybody who comes in. Don't be insulted. Um, just saves the tapes now. We don't serve a recording to you unless it's a working copy, a listening copy. Um, so uh, this is the first way we made copies of our recordings, was putting them on magnetic tape in the 80s. We made a copy of everything. Um, problem with these, if you get a magnet around them, they'll degrade. Some of them get something called sticky shed syndrome, uh, where the magnetic, magnetic coating, the oxide, peels off the tape. So we have the facilities to test for that and to fix that. There's a, a machine that tests for sticky shit with a penny so you can see the scale. They have to be baked in a convection oven. So these days, the, the collections that people send in, they've recorded on you know digital recording mechanisms. And there's one kind of digital recorder. I use a Zoom in the field. Um, there are many of these, but we're getting a lot of born digital collections now, and they come to us on, we, we prefer them to be sent to us on hard disks, and that's how you get your collection to us these days. And once we get it, we, we now put them on servers. So if you're coming in to listen to a born digital collection, you're going to be seated at uh, in a listening cubicle here, this is the Folk Life Reading Room, you'll be seated in one of these AV cubicles, and you're going to be listening to the files from a server at a computer. And then we'll take out any paper files that have logs and things relevant to this. So why do we, why do we go to the trouble to do all this? It's because we want you to be able to come to our reading room Scholars and musicians like Don Flemons, who's a founding member of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, Fufile from Louisiana who came to hear their field recordings of their relatives. We do it all so we can bring it to you. And 
We hope you'll come to our website, find us online, listen to the recordings, and feel free to ask us for technical assistance with your own archives.